Psalms 107. Psalms 107. Hello. Oh, oh hi, Charmaine. How are you? I'm good. Good yeah. to be back. Yes, it's good to see you. And I see Calvin yes. here, too. All right. Good to see Calvin. Yes, man. All right. How's everybody? We're doing good. Hello, Calvin. Calvin, did you get my phone call? Yeah. Yes, I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So we are on Psalms 107. And as I had said earlier in my uh, uh, preliminary remarks, uh, this is a beautiful portion of the psalm. And as we go ahead and have it read, you'll see why. But um, before I have it read, I'm not going to turn to the scripture, but you might want to jot it down. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 19. Uh, and it starts at verse 16. It goes to like, from like verse 16 to verse 26. And what it talks about is that person that came to Jesus and he called them good master. Remember that? And then Jesus said, why call ye me good? There is none good but who? But God. All right. And so keep that in your mind. And then we also want to keep in our mind um, Isaiah uh, 61, where Jesus said that uh, he's come to uh, set free the captive. He's come to set the prisoners free. Um, that's that famous portion of scripture that Jesus read uh, speaking about himself when he was in the temple and after he read that he said today this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing and then they wanted to stone him remember that they wanted to throw him off the cliff because of that uh, but uh, we'll, we'll get some, some touches on those portions of scriptures today uh, in our psalm and so without any delay, let's go ahead and get the psalm read. It's a long psalm. We're going to go through the, the entire psalm. Um, and uh, like I've stated, we probably won't finish it in our review today, but we definitely want to hear the whole thing. Let's take a listen. Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul, and filleth the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God, and condemned at the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and break their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass, and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Fools, because of their transgression, and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word, and he healeth them, and delivereth them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and declare his works with rejoicing. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out in their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. 
Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people, and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turneth rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turneth the wilderness into a standing water, and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation, and sow the fields and plant vineyards which may yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. Again they are minished, and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes, and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction, and maketh him families like a flock. The righteous shall see it, and rejoice, and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I told you this was a great psalm, didn't I? Yes. Did you see? Good evening, Good evening hi. Beverly. How you doing? And hello, Kim. Hi, 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 everyone. And so you see the beauty. We're in Psalms 107. We just had the reading done. And if you notice this, I want you to see that this psalm is actually broken up into sections. And I'm going to show you the sections first. Then we'll go back and we'll we'll go through. Look at, look at the first verse. It says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. All right. Now let's move over to verse 8. It says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord. Okay. Now let's go to verse 15. And it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord. Look at verse 21. It says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord. Look at verse 31. It says, oh, that men would praise the Lord. So you can see there is a natural division in here. And each one of these will bring out reasons for why we ought to praise the Lord. This psalmist is bringing forth an excellent work. If you remember the last two psalms, Psalms 105 and 106, the psalmist was bringing out all of the the, uh, the works and the things and showing how God was working with the, the, the people, uh, the nation Israel, how he brought them out, brought them through the wilderness. And remember, we went through all of that, and we saw how, how the psalmist was pointing that out and showing us how we can relate to that too, personally. Well, this particular psalm, this psalmist is bringing out how good God is. And he's going to bring out scenarios that we can relate to about the goodness of the Lord that will be referenced in other portions of Scripture, but also, as we will point out, can be applied to your life and to my life. And that's the beauty of the Scripture. This is a text message from God to every one of us. And it will say something that will definitely touch your spirit and your soul. So let's start. Verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. All right. Now, remember I told you to keep in mind Matthew uh, chapter 19, uh, verse 16, where the, that uh, man came to Jesus and said, good master. And Jesus said, why call ye me good? There is none good but who? But God. And so here we see the psalmist is picking up on that concept. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Now, what does that mean then? It means that there is nothing that is in error. There is nothing that is a mistake. There is nothing that is out of place. And so when you recognize that God is like that, number one, what that does is it, uh, it makes you realize that, and this is, this is the hard part uh, when it comes down to, to realizing that no matter what goes on in your life, it doesn't change the fact that God is good. Hmm. I have a saying that I used to say for years, I still say it, God is good even on a even. bad day. <laughs> it doesn't matter what kind of day you're having, that doesn't change the fact that God is good. So our psalmist starts off with that, 
and uh, uh, we're Ron, we're on Deacon. We're on uh, Psalms one oh seven. See, Deacon's just joined, and um, and so it starts off by saying, "Oh, give thanks." We need to be thankful that we know perfection, not in ourselves, but I know who has the perfect way. We can go to a perfected being, that is God, and we can go to him in prayer. As a matter of fact, he tells us to come to him in prayer. And we know we're going to get the answer. Now, the thing about it, because he's good and we're not, we're not going to always agree with God. When a child is being raised by a loving, caring parent, a child is not going to always agree with a loving, caring parent. I stated earlier, and as we were uh, welcoming everybody and talking, that me and my, my wife are doing a uh, uh, grandson uh, uh, and, and granddaughter sitting. And my grandson doesn't always want to do what we tell him to do. He's a little toddler. He wants to do his own little thing. Yeah. But my love for him will allow me to make sure that what I do, whether he likes it or not, is for his good. Now, extrapolate that up to a being like God that has the ability to know things that we can't even conceive of. My grandson doesn't understand the power of gravity. And that if he plays too much on the couch, he couldn't fall off on that couch. I tell him, don't be playing, don't be doing this, don't roll on the bed, because he don't understand that gravity, gravity is unforgiving. Gravity will pull you down. You make a mistake, guess where you're going? You, and, and all of us that are old enough to know, gravity has gotten all of us from time to time. We done fell off the steps. We done tripped on over our own two feet. We done slipped on ice, slipped on snow. Gravity has claimed all of us. Now, so has the world that we live in, which is a sinful world. And yet we serve a God that is never affected by sin to the point where he he ever stops being good that's just so that means that imagine a person that no matter what they do on this planet if there was an imaginary person that gravity could never affect them they could never fall never slip never hurt you would like, wow he could never fall or hurt himself he, well and that's an imaginary thing but what i'm trying to get you to see is the the this the inexhaustive aspect of god's goodness this it doesn't matter what happens no matter how the Pharisees and the Sadducees tried to trap Jesus. Remember, they tried to, they conspired. No matter what they did, they couldn't turn the goodness of God in the form of Jesus into something that got angry, got retaliated against them. He only did what was good for them by the nature of God. Even when he called them uh, hypocrites. At that point, it was good for them to know the truth about their nature. You see, good does not always mean fun. Good does not always mean nice. God is good and walked into the temple when they were buying and selling, and he overturned the temple. I mean, overturned the, the tables in the temple. Why? Because he's good, and he did not uh, 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 continue or sanction the stealing of money that was going on in the temple against those that were just trying to get there to know God. Aren't we glad that religious uh, organizations don't steal money today? Aren't we glad about that? <laughs> I, say, I say that with, with a smile on the back of my face because we know that's, that goes on all day long, don't it? Yeah. And so it's a problem. It's been a problem way back when. It was a problem when Jesus was walking the earth. And guess what? It's a problem today. But that doesn't change the fact that God is good. Because you got, remember the, the Laodicean church? They, they were so bad that Jesus had to come out and was on the what? Outside, knocking. Remember the story of the, um, of the prodigal son? And the prodigal son told the uh, father, give me my inheritance. And what did the son want with his inheritance? To go and live what kind of life? A riotous life, the Bible said. Well, guess what he had to do? He couldn't live that life on the same property with his father. He had to do what? He had to leave. But then when he came to himself, then he was able to what? Come back. Once again, God will not ever allow anything.
to not stop him from being good. And I'm taking my time and elaborating on that because I think it's important. And like I stated, I know I'm not going to finish this, this chapter anyway, so I'm going to take my time on these, these, these little portions here just so we can make sure we understand the goodness of God. He is good just because he is God all by himself. He never can, can at any point not be good. Everything that represents his presence always has a representation of perfection. Even during the offerings, when they had to offer up the, the lamb and the, and the turtle doves, how did you have to bring them? Without a what? Without a spot, without a, a blemish, without a wrinkle. And what did that represent? It was a shadow and it typifies the goodness, the perfection of God. So think about who we serve. That's the kind of God we're serving. So when you think, well, I don't think this is, this is right. This is, well, well, of course you don't. Because you don't think like God. We're not good like he is. So we'll think, I want this to happen. I want, th I want to have this, and I want this. And we can think of all kinds, and we pray all kinds of prayers, looking for God to do all kinds of stuff. And God is like, listen, I'm good. I know what's good for you. Because I know there's this thing out there, like, you know, like I was telling my grandson doesn't understand gravity. We don't understand sin. Sin will pull you down straight to hell. Sin will take, gravity will pull you to the ground. Sin will pull you to hell. Sin is stronger than gravity. It will pull you straight to the depths of hell. And God is watching over you, making sure you don't fall off the edge of your life and kill your crazy self or myself. So his goodness is so wonderful. Then the psalmist goes on and says, For his mercy endureth forever. Now, when you got a God that's that good and yet is merciful, Amen. I'm perfect, and all he wants around him is perfection. But then he says, I know you're not perfect. <laughs> you, you got issues. You got problems. You were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. And, 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 and you cannot have, you can't even help yourself. Sometimes when you try to be good, you still end up being a mess. That's us. That's how we are. But yet God says, but I got a bunch of mercy for you. You know what mercy is? Mercy is that, you know, you, know, um, uh, you see the people on the, on the high wire and they flip and jump and everything and then they let go of that wire and then they fall down. But guess what happens? They have that, that net or that trampoline and it just, it just doesn't allow gravity to smash them flat like a pancake. That net or that trampoline grabs them. And that's like the mercy of God. Sin is just pulling us down. Every time we look, we're falling off the rope, falling straight down the sand and God's mercy is right there just yep, bounce you right back up. I'm not going to let you kill your crazy self. I'm going to be right there for you. That's God's mercy. And he does that for us all the time. We don't recognize how he catches us in his hand. All right? That's his goodness. And it says it's like that for what? Forever. Wow, we could talk about the forever. We might as well. I'm Like I said, I'm not going to rush. That forever represents the aspect of Jesus. Remember when... Um, John in the in the book of Revelation when he he said that he heard the angel and the angel called called him up into uh, the third into the into the heavens, and um, John was weeping because there was nobody that w was worthy to open the seals on the scroll, and John was weeping and then the angel said, "Don't weep, for the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the, to open the, the seals." And when John turned and looked at the lion of the tribe of Judah, he said he saw Jesus as a, as a lamb as though it had been what? Slain. So it speaks to the fact that this was way after his death, burial, and resurrection, but in some perception of vision of seeing Jesus, he still is looked at as a sacrifice. That's the, for, that's the forever part. God's forever sacrifice. Remember when Jesus was risen already and Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it until I can see the nail prints in his hands and, and, the, and the, the wound on his side. And then the next, next day, several days later, Jesus appeared to them. And what did Jesus say to Thomas? Look at my hands. Look at the nail prints in my hands. Look at the wound on my side. Now, what does that mean? It means he still has the wounds. 
See, when we go to heaven, I don't care what scars or, 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 or blemishes or deformance that you have, when you go to heaven, you're not taking that with you. You are going to be made whole. The Bible says that the, the, in the New Jerusalem, there's a tree with the leaves are there for the healing of the nation. We will be met, met, we're going to be in a new body. We're going to be fully the, uh, 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 glorified in the way we are supposed to be. And the concept of us bringing forth some, some sickness or illness is not even a thought. We know we're going to be whole. However, in heaven, from what we can see in scripture, there will be some times when we will look at Jesus and see him as conquering king. There will be other times we will look at Jesus in heaven, in eternity, and we will see uh, the Lamb of God. And the Lamb of God that was slain. And he will have that forever. We will have eternal glorified body. He will have all of that aspect, but he will also have a sense in which he is still always and for eternity the sacrifice which is why we will have always and eternity relationship because the person that paid for my sin was, was always there it's a it's an everlasting payment uh it's a beautiful thing when you think about it and, and when you make the the concept of what the lord paid to redeem us it's significant if we think about the fact that God says, I'm going to have you go, I'm going to turn you into a cat so, I, so you can go talk to the cats. And you say, okay, I'll talk. And he says, but I want you to know, I'm not going to turn you into one of them big cats. You're going to be one of them little teeny scrawny cats. All right, that's fine. I'll, I'll go there. I'll do your will. Now, but the thing is, once I turn you into a cat and you talk to the cats, you're going to have to be a cat forever. Now, you think about that. Jesus, for all time, will be Jesus, the sacrificial lamb. When you think about that. Yes, sir. Yes, Wayne. That's why I was saying, like when you was talking, that's why, like, Thomas, that's why we'll have to see those scars, the nail marks in his hand, stabbing his side, you know, so we, so when we start to doubt, look, this is what I paid for you, you're well. Mm -hmm. You're healed. I'm carrying it all. Yep. That's why we won't see our bruises. We won't. How many times we hit bottom? Mm -hmm. You know, like for me, how many times I hit bottom before I realized I can't go no further? Mm -hmm. You know, I got to pick myself up now. Yeah. But see, that's, that's the way it is. You know, you got to hit bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, that's if you don't hit bottom, it ain't going to work. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go to a point where you say, "Look, I drop, I quit, I can't, I can't, I cannot do it." That's right. You no, know? and that's what it all falls down to. I, I see that. That's why I go back, like I said, reading the Bible, going through the Bible with you, and like, like I said, my sponsor told me, he said, he said, Wayne, I don't care what nobody. I'm telling you, he said, I don't care what nobody tells you, until you realize. That all these programs is gospel. You can't get clean mm -hmm. until you realize this is all about the Bible. It's all about one man. Mm -hmm. There's only one man that can set you free. He's the only one that can take that disease that you have away. Right. But he lets you know you still have it. Mm -hmm. But he can deal with it for you. That's right. Because you can't. You've been trying to do this for life. You know? Yep. He's the only one that can help you. Right. No, no matter where, no matter, no matter what, no matter how many times I try to to do things on my own, and told my sponsor, said, "Man, just give up. Mm. Quit. You can't do it. Stop trying." He said, "Listen, follow me. Get in line. Mm. Tell you like my sponsor told me. Get behind me. You follow me. Mm -hmm. All right. You want me to be your sponsor? I'm gonna start all over from the beginning mm. with you." Like he started with me, and we all walk this path together again. All right. You know, and like you said, if I don't give it away, I can't keep it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what that's what I see. You you taking you taking this? 
If you don't give it away, you can't keep it. Mm -hmm. It's not meant for you to keep. That's right. It's meant for you to give it away. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's why God put it in you. He put it in you for you to give it away. That he is... said, wait, look, I'm going to give you this, but here's what I want you to do with it. I want you to give it over there. I want you to put some over there. Mm -hmm. I want you to put some over there. Put some over there. A little bit underneath there. You know, you got to give it to everybody. That's right. And you that... know, like I said, you know, like, like I always said, the hour. Man, I don't like rushing, man. I mean, we can step right in the first verse all night. <laughs> we don't have to go no further. <laughs> we could do it. You know? I tell you, we, we could spend a lot of time in there. That's for sure. Right. You know, somebody's preaching. Somebody's <laughs> preaching. <laughs> I tell you. you know? But I, I have to tell you, Wayne, your, your testimony has touched uh, many people, um, you know, because not a lot of people number one would be is up front and uh, me and my wife we often uh, refer and talk about you uh you don't know sometimes how god is using you just being hungry for god knowing and 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 saying where you came from and say well listen i know where i came from but right now i'm hungry for god i might have been eating right. i might have been and we all can say this to some degree in our past lives We've been eating some slop and some bad stuff. You know, we, eat, we eat the food that this world gives. But at some point when God gives you a hunger and a thirst for him, yes. then it's like, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now you're like, man, why was I eating all that slop before that the world was giving out? And I, when I could have been eating the things of the Lord. And it makes your spirit so healthy. It, it really revives you. And those are the good things. And that's what makes him good. That's what makes him merciful. But the psalmist, he's just getting started here. Like Wayne said, that's just the first verse. Look at verse 2. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now, that's what Wayne was just doing. That's exactly what he, all I can do. You see that, you see that portion there? Well, just look at, what, look at what Mr. Smith just did. He's a redeemed person, and he said, let me tell you what God has done for me. Yeah. I tried to do it on myself, and I couldn't do it. Well, let me tell you what happened. I'm going to say so. I'm going to tell you what I, what I went through, what I tried, how I tried to do it myself. I tried this. And I tell you, we could, all, we could write a book on what I tried. We all could write a book. I tried this, tried left, tried right, tried up, down, front, back, tried yellow, green, purple, blue. None of this stuff worked until you tried Jesus. Amen. You come to the Lord, Amen. and now you find something that works. Now, does it mean that, okay, I found Jesus. I can now stop trying. No. you got to continue to put faith in God. Well, okay, I'm going to put my faith in him. Now I can just, just relax. No, because faith without works is what? It's dead. <clears throat> so, therefore, God has called you to be a what? A servant. That's what Jesus is. He's a servant. Jesus says, I'm your master. When he was at the, uh, the, the, um, the Last Supper, he said, I'm the master, but I wash your feet. Remember that? He was washing their feet. And then Peter was like, I'm never going to let you wash my feet. And why did Peter say that? Because from the way the world taught not only Peter, but it teaches us, the master is the one that's supposed to have his feet washed. The servant's supposed to wash. But Jesus said, no, you see what I did? I'm your, I'm your, your teacher. I'm your master. But yet I washed your feet. Once again, like what Wayne said. If you have something, you got to be able to give. And we got it so twisted that a minister is supposed to be a servant. You're supposed to minister to people. When you have a servant, you're supposed to be serving people. We flipped that around some kind of way where now, you know, everybody's serving the so-called minister. And when you come to service, you ain't coming to get served. That You're coming to serve, you know, to, to put the work. And, and our concepts are all twisted. Um, I'm not saying that, that everything is bad because you know what? None of us got it all right. No, nobody. But at the same time, sometimes it's important to recognize how does the Lord want us to do it? So you, the, the key is I'm redeemed. I'm going to say so. I'm going to let people know what God has done for me. All right? And I'm, I'm going to do it out of my love for God and my appreciation, not out of a means of making profit. The scripture says, seeing that we have received this ministry, we walk uprightly, not 
handling the word of God deceitfully. We got to be careful that we don't do that. So then it goes on. You know, and, Go ahead. and like I said, the beauty, the beauty of it is it's, it's, it's easy. It, it's, it's real easy for me to stay clean. It's real simple. All I got to do is say, God, remove the desire. Mm -hmm. Remove this desire that I had. See, I don't have the desire. Mm -hmm. I don't have the desire to do drugs. I get the urge. And that's what my sponsor took. He said, you don't want the urge to go away. Because so see, the urge is over now you think you're healed. Mm -hmm. You know? Because like I said, I can see that sometimes in my stupid mind. My stupid mind is I sit back, I cross my legs, and my stupid mind is saying, you know what? Man, you've been doing this so long. You know how to do it now. Mm. Go and try it. <laughs> I say, shut up, devil. Yep. Mm. Yep, you got to rebuke yourself. You know? That's right. But like I said, it's, like I said, this, that day when that man came and took me out for that little lunch that we had at Wendy's, and he said, when you come to church with me, <laughs> and you know me, because I don't want to hear him talking, I'm trying to get to the go. <laughs> you know? But I'm telling myself, you know, as soon as we leave the house, I'm going to call him and tell him I can't make it. Yep. Right? God said, no. Uh-uh. Not, 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 no. It's time. I couldn't get my phone open. My sister wouldn't open the phone for me. She wouldn't call for me. She said, it's only an hour. Yep. You know? Yep. And now look what at... I'm saying. The, the devil, right away. Mm -hmm. Right away. I told him, yeah. And then they, the devil let me say... Think, you know, as soon as you leave, all you got to do is call him and tell him you can't make it. Something mm -hmm. came up. Mm -hmm. You know, God said, no, not this time. I got you now. <laughs> yep. Yep. I got you now. He, he had the hook you right know? in you. And he, and, and he yep. still and he's still reeling you in. Yes, he Yeah. Did. And like I said, it's hard, but, it, but it is, it's, it's beautiful. It because, is. like, when I talked to my sisters on Monday, they don't ask me, they don't say, Wayne, how you doing? You know what they say to me? How was church? All right. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's you know, yeah. Every Monday, they all call me, how was church? There you go. Yeah. Tomorrow morning, they got all call, how was Bible study? There you go. You know, they don't call and say, Wayne, how you doing? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know? Like, one day they called me, I said, Barbara, I said, you know, I went to sleep, man. You know, and I missed Bible study. She said, you know you have Bible study. Why would you even lay down? Mm. I said, I was tired. She <laughs> said, no, you wasn't tired. You just didn't want to have Bible study. You know? So now what I do Wednesday morning, when I get out of bed, I set the Bible in a laptop on the table. I got the Bible up. I don't know, open up the laptop till uh, 10.30 mm -hmm. or 7.30. Right. But the Bible, my glasses, and the Bible's open. There you go. Mm -hmm. People going out and say, wait, you got, like the girl's came and she said, you got church? I said, yeah. She said, what time? I said, 8 o'clock. She said, yeah, but you got everything open. I said, it is why I won't go to sleep. <laughs> I don't want to see so far. <laughs> okay. Well, that's the beauty of it. That's what you call letting yeah. the redeem of the Lord say so. Yep. That's it. And look what he yep. says on the second part of that second verse. It says, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Now, I underline the word enemy because sometimes people don't recognize. You think everybody loves you. You think every you think everybody has got your back or everybody's your friend. Or you know what? You think the devil don't get into nobody. You know that the, you know that the apostle, you know the apostle Peter, Jesus had to rebuke the devil out of Peter. Told he looked and turned to Peter and said, "Get thee what? Behind me, Satan." Because Peter was telling Jesus how he is supposed to redeem man. He said, you don't got to die. Oh, you don't got to die. And so, and you can, you can mean well and be speaking for the devil. Meaning well. Because see, the devil is a liar. He comes as a wolf in sheep's clothing. So he always seems to look proper. You know? And then the devil can quote scripture. He quoted scripture to Jesus. For it is written, you shall cast thyself down 
and the angels will bear thee up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Satan quoted that to Jesus. That's our enemy. And if you ever lose sight and forget that you have an enemy, you then become vulnerable because you think that nobody's shooting at you. Talk to Job. He knows we got an enemy. Talk to David. He knows. Talk to Samson. Big, strong, mighty man. He watched the enemy break him down. Right? Look at Moses. He, he, the enemy got him to kill a man. Right? All of these things that, that, that we got to keep in mind, that we have an enemy. And the enemy knows what your potential is. See, some of us could be in jail for a lot of things if the enemy had their way. Some of us would, would, could be doing a whole bunch of other stuff if the enemy had their way in our life. He knows what we could be really good at that could get us in all kinds of trouble. And that's why he says he's redeemed us from the hand of the enemy. I thank God for that. Because I don't want to be with Satan to try to form in my life. I thank God for what Jesus is forming in my life. And even with that, we still have to be prayerful and careful because we're not in heaven yet. Or we're in heavenly places and we're in God's hand. And the scripture says nobody can pluck us out of his hand. And the scripture also says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. But even with that, sometimes God will allow the hedge to be brought down. Talk to Job. Read his book. We talked about that. And so it's important yeah, I like to recognize. That because I go back to when we started songs, when you told everybody, you better get your garbage bag. Yep. When you told them, get up, get them, get it. No, not the little bag, get the big black bag. That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I from this here. It's all it's here. It's all about us, right here. It's going to tell you about yourself. And, uh, yes. You're gonna you're gonna like some of it. You're gonna be you're gonna be upset with some of it, and, you, and some of it's gonna make you mad. But that's okay. Sometimes the truth will make you mad, and that's okay. Look at verse three. And gather them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Now, what does that say? That sometimes when you don't, when you are lost, guess where you are? You everywhere. See, when you lost, you everywhere except where you what supposed to be. A person that's lost that and, and has not found God, no matter where they are, they are lost. They don't know where they are or where they're going or how to get where they need to go. They're going to need a direction from God. And God pulls us from all kinds of places. Some of us live in the north. Some of us live in the south. You know, the north we represent. Some of us come from highfalutin things. You know, not everybody that comes to comes to God is poor, broke, and all. Some people come to God and they got a whole lot of this world's goods, but recognize these world's goods is what's corrupting me. Some people come from the South. Man, that, I tell you, I, I didn't have nothing. I was poor, broke. You know, some people come from the from the from the East and from the West, uh, way off, kind of spiritual, but not serving God, serving Buddha and, and Confucius and all. That. And some people come from the, from, the, from the east. I don't believe there's no God at all. So you can see all the different directions that people come, but God calls us to himself. And he finds us where we are. Look what he says in verse 4. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Now, we know that speaks of who? Israel. The nation Israel. They're, they're going, they were in the wilderness. But doesn't that apply to us before we found God? You, you, I, I can speak for myself. I remember sometimes when people would say, Wayne, don't you want to go to church? I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't do church, man. I don't do it. I, I tried that, that Jehovah's Witness stuff, and that, that, and, and that was like something that I wanted to, and that, I'm like, that didn't work either. I'm done with church. And so I was like, you know, I'm not going nowhere. I'm just going to just do my own thing. Well, that means I'm where? I'm just wandering. I have no direction. I don't know anything about reality, about spirituality. I'm trying to do my what? My own thing. And the Bible says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, 
but the end thereof are the ways of death. Why is that? Let me tell you why every other way will take you to destruction. Because Jesus said that he is the way to the Father. And, there, and, and, and by no other means can you come to the Father except by him. Now, I didn't say that. Jesus said that. So therefore, if, if you say, well, I don't like the fact that you, the only way to God is through Jesus, well, then take that up with Jesus, because I didn't say it. He's the one that said it. So when you're wandering in the wilderness in a solitary place, that means you're just spinning in circles, going from one lost place to another lost place. And then it says, um, and they found no city to dwell in. I found nothing that makes me feel like this is where I belong. See, when you come to Jesus, you be, and, and when you really know the Lord, you recognize, this is where I belong. This is it. This is what I've been looking for. All right? And you then recognize where your natural body is, because your soul is like, oh, I'm satisfied. Your soul is like, this is, this is what I've been trying to find. But your natural body is like, I still don't like what I'm dealing with here on earth. And you know why? Because you are now a stranger and you, you, you are a, a sojourner in a strange land. And your natural body recognizes this ain't home. This is not where I want it because you see the corruption, the sin, the, the, uh, all of the abuse that we see in this world. And we know this is not the place that my soul can rest at. I find no city except the city of God. So when you're walking in your own ways, when you're traveling north, south, east, and west, and you're doing everything but Jesus, you're never going to find home. You're never going to find satisfaction. You're always going to be wandering. All right? And um, verse 5, it says, Hungry and thirsty, their soul, their soul fainted in them. That's why Jesus said, uh, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, or they shall be fed. Once you want to, once your appetite changes, because you see, going back to how we was, see, when I was telling folks I ain't going to church, I had a different appetite. <laughs> I wasn't looking for God, I was looking for something else. And I was looking for, and I thought I was kind of good at what I was looking for. Oh, I'm going to find what I'm looking for, I'm going to go do that, do this. And you begin to realize it doesn't satisfy. Well, you got what you was looking for, but you ain't happy. You, I'm tired of this. I want another one. Oh, well, I don't like this one. Let me try that one. And before you know it, it's like, well, wait a minute. Emptiness goes in. You're eating what this world is providing, and you're never full. You're never, your thirst is never quenched. And that's why we see so many very wealthy, very rich, very powerful very famous people that are still miserable because they think that all of this stuff they have accumulated should satisfy them, and it doesn't. Jesus talked about that. He talked about that, that uh, wealthy man that had uh, those barns, and his barns were full. He said the rich man had these great barns, and he, had, he was so successful, and he says he made so much uh, merchandise that his barns are now full. He says, I know what I'm going to do. All right? Now, why does he got to tear down his own barn? Because he ain't happy with what he's got. He's not satisfied. But wait a minute. Your barns are full. And you're not satisfied? Nope. I'm going to tear these down and build bigger barns. And what did Jesus say? You fool. You are fool. Jesus called the man a fool. Because you're trying to fill yourself up with the things of this world. Jesus said that uh, you can gain the whole wide world and lose your soul. He says, what profit is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? It would be foolish. It would be like that rich man that tore down his barns to build bigger. Why? Because your hunger and your thirst are for the things outside of God. When you hunger and thirst for the things of God, you will be satisfied. Even in the midst of this world, where corruption and hatred and all this stuff, you will find peace. You will be growing uh, in the Lord. Like Jesus said, let the wheat and the tares do what? Grow together. Yeah. All right? So you're going to grow down this world. This evil in this world is going to grow too. But guess what you're doing? You're growing also. 
you're going to meet the match and be able to sustain the generation that you're growing in. And when you are done growing, guess what? God's going to come and bring you on up. Right? And then you move, you're going to move on to that real city. It says, uh, uh, so their souls fainted. That speaks to the spiritual. You can give this natural man everything it lusts for, and you will still not be happy because your soul will faint. All right? You will not have a, a satisfied soul. Look at verse 6. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. Well, why are they troubled? Because they've been wandering. They done went to the north. They went to the south. They went to the east. They went to the west. They, they were hungry. They tried this food, that food, the other food, this drink, that drink, this drink. And now they're still fainting. And so now in verse 6 it says, They cried unto the Lord in their trouble. Because they recognized that if you do all this stuff, you are not being protected from the enemy. The enemy will lie to you and tell you, oh, go get this, go try this, get this one, go get this thing, and you are never going to be satisfied. Then deliverance comes. Then, and it's that whole thing, then. What did you do before you, you, before you entered into your then? I did all this, then I came to the Lord. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. See, I didn't cry unto the Lord, let me get myself together. That's what a lot of people say. I'm going to come to God once I get myself together. No. Come to God in your mess. Come to God in your trouble. Look, he said, he said, they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of most of their distress. No. Delivered them out of their distress. And see, what it is, it's not, well, I'm distressed here, I'm distressed. There's only one distress. And that distress is not knowing God. Once you know God, then you're satisfied. That's why David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. In other words, I'm not going to be distressed. Why? Because thou art with me. And then David went and talked about how he leadeth me through the green pastures. He, 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 he filleth my soul. You know, why? I'm in a... Valley of shadow of death. I'm not in a, pl a, a good place. That's what this world is. It's a, it's a place that's like a shadow of death. But I have God with me. I don't fear. I'm not going to be distressed. He's going to deliver me out of all my distresses. Verse 7. It says, and lead me. And it says, says, let me read that again. And he leadeth them forth by the right way. Oh. So there is a right way. There is a way to go. Jesus said, I am the what? The way, the truth, the truth and the life. That's the way. And so if you're going any other way, remember, some of them went north, south, east, west. It don't matter. You got to find the way. Well, which way is it? It's not a north, south, east, or west thing. It's a who you know thing. So you got to go to Jesus. It says, uh, so it says, and he led them forth by the right way, and they, that they might go to the city of habitation. Go to a city where you can be, where, where you can have uh, habitation or life or living, existence. And that means you will have worth, you will have value, you will have energy, you will have purpose. That's what habitation speaks of. Things that you can actually utilize and feel. You have a, a way to go. A thing to do. You feel valuable. God is using me. God is helping me. I'm allowing, I'm, I'm being a servant to other people. I'm looking at what God gave me, and I'm trying to take what God given, gave me, and I'm going to try to give it to everybody that I can give it to. And you say, well, what is it that God can give? That you can? Some people, all it is is a pleasant word. I have a friend he lives in Florida. You know what he you know what his ministry is? He sends text messages, have a great day. God loves you. Just simple stuff, just like that. He sends I, just randomly. It ain't like he sends it every Tuesday or every Thursday. He, it's random. Whenever whatever he, it pops in his mind, he and I get it and I'm like it seems as though whenever I get it and whatever he sends me, I'm like, "Oh wow, that's great. I needed to see that today." And he sends all kinds of little things, little poems and things. 
and nothing long. Everything's like you know one sentence at the most. You know, not sometimes it's just two or three words. And I'm like, that's a great. And I told him when he came up to visit, he has a. Uh, 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 they, they have a grand uh, son, well, a daughter and a grandchild up here in Vegan. They come up to visit uh, once a year, and they live in Florida. And I told them, I said, listen, your ministry is just powerful. I said, you have no idea when you send these out to people. And he said, well, I just have a list of names, and every now and then when God puts it on my heart, I send somebody something. And he's just using, the, you know, using his phone, just, hey, let you know that God loves you or, you know, God can do all things or never quit. It's just little stuff like that that he sends. And I told him, I said, God has put that in your heart and it's a great ministry. And what it does is just encourages. That's what the Barnabas, he was a son of consolation. All right? And so a lot of times people are looking to say, well, what can I do? It's whatever you can do that is ease, that you can do with very least, you know, it don't have to be something that, that well, this is hard for me to do. Whatever you can do that you know, I can do this. I can do this all day long. And people will be blessed by it. Wayne, do you have a... I met a guy, I met a guy like that. I was working for the Hayward. Down at uh, the social service building in Pisco. And uh, Hayward never knew it. But he had a guy, he used to call him Uncle Gene. And Uncle Gene used to come there when I was struggling with my recovery. Uncle Gene used to come in and say, you still a friend of Bill? And I always say, thanks, man. I said, yeah, I'm hanging in there. All right. He said, hang in there. All right. That's all he would say to me. Mm-hmm. And going about his business. That's he right. said, you still a friend of Bill's? Every day when you come in, he said, you still a friend of Bill's? Mm-hmm. You know? They didn't tell me, you know, uh, step by step. You know? And I think, he said, yeah, step by step, one day at a time. Mm-hmm. And what he was doing, he was telling me, other meetings to go to. Mm. They had me from step by step. <laughs> right. One day at a time. Right. And those were two meetings I never went to. Mm-hmm. So that Saturday, I went to step by step. Mm-hmm. Sunday, I asked my sponsor, I said, can we go to one day at a time? He said, oh, I didn't know you wanted to go to the place. I had plenty of places to take you. Right. And, that, and that's, like I said, that was the time I was really, really struggling. Mm-hmm. But that's really tell me every day we come in. Because there's that problem with the roof. Mm-hmm. But you know what? It wasn't the roof. God sent him there for me. Mm-hmm. It wasn't about that roof, man. <laughs> it wasn't about that roof. Because he didn't have to tell me that he was in recovery. That's right. But he told me by just saying little simple things. Yeah. Are you still a friend of Bill's? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? And, and those are... He's done. He, he just cracked me up and he said, he said, you need a kiss? I said, come on, Uncle Gene. He said, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, you always tell me you need a kiss. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a good kiss. Keep it yes. simple, stupid. Yep, that's yeah. right. <laughs> K-I-S-S. Yeah. And like I said, he, he give me something every day, man. Yeah. yeah. And people that I do... I get him. They would just call him Uncle Gene. Yeah. yeah. People, people that do that, they, they, sometimes they don't realize... That that is more powerful sometimes than you sitting down look listen to some two hour sermon and somebody you know it's just something that's just gonna take you long it's, it's like a vitamin pack man and it just fills you with all kinds of goodness all right and now um, I told y'all we weren't gonna finish right I already gave you that warning so we're gonna take our time through this but this was this is too good this is I, I showed you the different courses in here right we went through all the different uh, uh, old that men should. Well, we just finished that first meal, that first course. We got some more courses to do here. But it's, it just said that this is the habitation. Now, that next course is going to start in verse 8, where it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness uh, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Now, you want to know what that means? Let me tell you exactly what that means. Oh, wait a minute. I'm out of time. We'll do that next week. <laughs> No, you, uh, still, you still got three minutes. Uh, we got, well, we got three. Over yet. I know we got three minutes, but I'm I'm going to now give opportunity for anybody, oh, okay. anybody that's got any comments or questions about what we talked about in this first section here. 